Hi, and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know, a podcast about classical education, the classical world, old books, uh, sometimes philosophy, actually a lot of times philosophy, yes. so much so that we've even gotten emails saying, like, why do you like philosophy so much? Um, and we package it into a podcast for you, our dear listener. Um, my name is Graham Donaldson, and I am joined with my two philosophers in crime. In <laughs> what? <laughs> AJ Hannenberg. Yeah. Hi. And Thomas Fletcher Magby. Hi. And today, AJ, are you offended uh, by being called a philosopher? Like that, that seems like a no, title. No, but you I'm would offended have. that he gets a middle name every time, and I don't. Every single time I get my middle name, I'm terrified of my identity being stolen because of this podcast. <laughs> oh. And like, he, and he, like naming my, like giving out the names of my children. And, and I'm my also wife jealous and, that yeah. uh, social that you have such a rad middle name. I Brock, really am. Graham Brock Donaldson. It's so strong. No. It's so strong. Yeah. It sounds like you're out there laying bricks. But you're Arthur Yon. That's so cool. That's a good one too. Uh, it's, Arthur Yon's pretty great. Yeah, Yon's pretty good. Yeah, I mean that's what I do when I'm tired. You yawn. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> so That's a great joke. Um, <laughs> you should listen to this podcast. This <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> is a great podcast, hey, I promise. Well, yeah. um, so we are, from what I hear and what I can see from your notepad, we are doing the often requested part two of Kant. The, has it been requested? No, but there was one YouTube comment. <laughs> there was one YouTube comment that says... That said, I think it was on the first Kant episode or it was an email and it was like, oh man, I love you guys. You totally didn't nail Kant, but great job <laughs> or something like that. Or maybe it was a tweet. I don't know. Someone, really? said, someone told us that we like totally butchered Kant. And man, I was yeah, like, the, I don't know, man. The, the Kant episode is definitely not on YouTube right now. Oh, so okay. yeah, we are, uh, we are slightly behind on YouTube. I think, Wait, so uh, that's not on YouTube. Was it a tweet? It was, must have been a tweet. How that did I not nail Kant? I just I thought we nailed Kant. Said what it said. I you did a great job, yes. AJ, and I'm sorry I'm for so these quick, critical fun. comments being brought I'm coming in the second part of Kant, and the first thing I hear is that everybody hates my first Kant episode. It's the only feedback we got. Why would you share this? Hates Graham, what are you just, doing? There's a guy out there who hates you. <laughs> <laughs> but only one. Yeah, don't yeah. worry about it. In, yeah. this ep- in this episode, it's for you, big There's only one no. person on the internet who thinks you're wrong, so it's okay. <laughs> it's only one. That's pretty good. Yeah, actually. There's a lot of people in there. There's like, there are a lot of people like on the internet. at least 30. <laughs> there are at least 30. That There's is no way to really count, because yeah. it might be just the same 30 people with a whole bunch of different robots. Like, also you know, true. Okay. That's, you know what? That's true. <laughs> New conspiracy theory. Let's talk about Immanuel Kant. Okay, so... Would you guys remember what we did in the first episode? You were wrong about everything he believed, I think is what Twitter <laughs> told me. Um, I, we, uh, the, the I'm thi- done with this. <laughs> this is our last episode of Classical <laughs> Stuff. Uh, <laughs> Kant seemed to be taking Aristotle's uh, ideas and kind of pushing them. Uh, instead of it being about, it was, instead of it being, it was about goodwill. That, that was the big, the big thing that we spent a lot of time talking about was the intention of the, of the agent is important. So we a, we ended up talking a whole lot about the the proper the the most v- worthwhile thing in humanity which was to Kant a goodwill and yes. to Aristotle it is human happiness. Mm-hmm. The thing we should aim for is human happiness. To Kant it is the the supremely good thing is a goodwill. It is supremely valuable no matter if the, the goodwill is actually effective or not, mm-hmm. right? So we argued a lot about that. Uh, what was the other thing we argued about? There was another thing we argued a bunch about about that was when I remember. That was when that I was kept, the main thing. That, that was, was when I thing. kept thinking about because hey, okay, take two people. One guy is lucky and happy. Okay. And one guy has the Kantian goodwill and everything just like doesn't work out for him. I'd rather be the first guy than the second guy. Right? But not what if you're not good? I think I think in here you're assuming that you are also a good person with a good will. Say but, you're a person with an no, but evil Aristotle, will. No, but Aristotle says that the person who's happy also has to be. Anyway, whatever. Maybe maybe the, we're now arguing. arguing yeah, we're, we're, we're hitting episode one again. Yeah. So the, the, where we ended episode two was establishing the categorical imperative. Do you guys remember what the categorical imperative says? Everyone eats fish on Tuesday? I think that was it. Yeah, nailed it. I mean, it, it, he's nailed it in that it's the thing that, like, anything that one person should do, everyone should do. Or you should act in a way such that whatever act you are doing becomes a law that all humankind will follow. Yeah. The, the, I, the head principle of morality is that in anything you do, you should act such that the maxim you are following would apply to all men and you wouldn't have a problem with it. Yep. In book two, he goes a little bit more to establishing this categorical imperative and sort of explaining some of the reasoning behind it. He just sort of develops the, the notion more. Book two is easily the longest of the three chapters in the Groundwork for the Metaphysics of Morals by Kant, which is the book we're reading from. And it took me, I was actually supposed to record this podcast a little while ago, but I just, I hadn't fully 
grokked or understood the the <laughs> subject matter. You guys know that word grokked? I yeah, kind of. It's from like a it's from a sci-fi book. I, think. I wasn't sure if it was a book or a short story, but it, it, it to what, grok yeah. means to fully understand. Because so, uh, does it, it is it does the story take place in like is it a civilization with just different language? Like what's oh, the? I haven't read. Oh, it. oh, oh sorry, uh, <laughs> Thomas. I can't read. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that explains a lot of our episodes. Yeah, no, that's good. <laughs> so I, I hadn't fully got it, and I I had the the time yesterday and today to reread most of it. And are make those some all more your notes? notes? Oh yeah, that's a ton of notes, man. It's so dense. I'm not gonna lie. This is this is not easy going. It's and isn't there a part three after this? There is a chapter three. That's it's what I very mean. short. Do you think you'll cover it? I guess we'll get there at the end. I'm yeah, cur- I'm I think we'll absolutely you... cover okay. it. I haven't read it yet, okay. so I, it depends on how interesting it is. If it's just like, and here's a list of cats, um, <laughs> I, I probably won't I would love cover to spend that. an hour on that. That'd be great. But chapter two really does have some good stuff, and I think there's plenty of stuff for us to argue about. So let's jump in. And I will just sort of walk you through his second chapter and him developing the idea of the categorical imperative. And I'll do the best I can, random guy on the internet uh, with Kant. So hopefully I don't butcher this. But remember, this is, you know, second or third read through. And I I definitely annotated. So I I feel like I'm doing pretty good. You're doing a great job. Okay. So he begins with why we need to have an a priori method in ethics. What does a priori mean? Before any experience, just like ahead of time. Yeah, it means... Reason only, sure. right? So why do we need to have a reason only method for ethics? Well, reason number one is because we cannot prove that anyone, even ourselves, has ever really done an act of moral worth. Now, if you remember last episode, an act of moral worth rather than moral value is one that we do without any self-interest, right? You do it simply because the law commands, not because you want anything out of it. You can't prove that even you have ever done one of these. It might be that you simply didn't notice an inner motive where you really did kind of want something out of it. You wanted to feel good for that day. You wanted the tax write off. You wanted a a girl to think you were cool by giving all this, you know, food to a homeless person. And or even today, you wanted to get some Internet clout by recording yourself giving away money to homeless people. Sure. Right. So we can't even prove that the own our own acts, our own things that we have done are of any moral worth, let alone prove that anyone else has done any act of moral worth. And therefore, it's really hard to derive ethics from other people's acts of moral worth. I can't point to examples and be like, here is an act that we can follow for ethics because I don't really know their motives and they might be terrible, right? So it's really hard to sort of gather an ethic from that. Didn't we separate moral worth and moral value? Was that yes, thing moral value is one that contributes to the... So the goodness of the world, so right? There are, there are acts that are beneficial to the world, but we don't know if there's moral value because we don't have the reason behind the act. Moral worth. Moral Sorry. value yeah. is something that is is just good for people, right? Yeah. Even even if I like post a video about it on the internet and make a whole bunch of money and get a whole bunch of likes for it, I still gave a bowl of soup to a homeless person, right? right? That's, that's an act that's of moral value. Yeah. But it's not an act of moral worth. I did it for my own interest. There was no actual real... I didn't do it simply because the law of goodness said this is a thing you should do for this homeless person. Got it. Right? Okay. That's moral value versus moral worth. But that's the first reason why we need a reason-only method. The second is because it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter the question of whether or not there is there has ever been an act, action that is simply morally good or pure duty. Because the real thing is that if we want our laws, our moral laws to have wide scope, then no single experience can merit a wide application. If I point to a a few single acts and say, okay, these single acts sort of establish a law, I can't apply that law widely because those single acts happened in individual circumstances with individual, like all kind of extenuating things going on around them. And I would not be able to make, therefore, a wide application of that law. Maybe it only applies in America for the three things that I saw, the three people that were doing good. So if we want to apply a law broadly for all rational beings, it must be derived as separate from experience. Does that make sense? Makes sense. It's like the experience would bias you in some way or that um, uh, we need to establish these things ahead of time Otherwise, we'll have these other conflicting interests once we're actually in a situation. Yeah, it'll right? color it, it yes. right? So it has to be sort of a, a pure reason-only thing. Now, I'm, I'm going to read this, uh, this section that says, moral principles not derivable from examples. So, nor could one give morality worse advice than by trying to derive it from examples. For every example of morality presented to me must itself first be assessed with moral principles to see whether it deserves to be used as an original example or as a model. So if I'm watching somebody do a thing and I'm like, ah, yes, here's an example of morality, it's because I have just evaluated it based on something else. Right. 
right? So it cannot really serve as the basis for morality because I have to evaluate it by morality first. He says, by no means can it have the authority to give us the concept of morality. Even the holy one of the gospels must first be compared with our ideal of moral perfection before we can acknowledge him to be such. Even he says of himself, why do you call me whom you see good? There is none good, but the, God, but the one God alone whom you do not see. But where do we get the concept of God as the highest good only from the idea of moral perfection, which reason designs a priori and connects inseparably with the concept of a free will? So we can't even use Jesus as, as an example for morality because we have to look at him and say, okay, is he good? And then once we've evaluated him, we affirm him as an example. But we've compared him to something and Kant's trying to get to that something. What yes. are we comparing all things to to see if it's right or not? Exactly. And I think... I feel like this part is kind of in conversation with a whole bunch of other philosophers in his day who are sort of doing a practical, popular f philosophy sure. where it's like, here are a bunch of examples that we should follow, and that's morality. And he sort of argues against it. And I'm going to sip, skip a section that says the inadequacy of popular practical philosophy because I don't feel like that conversation is still happening. Okay. But he was sort of arguing with them, and I don't think we need to argue with him anymore. But I do think that principle is important, that... We can't really derive our morality from examples. This is what people do, and that's good, and therefore we should do it. Like, not only would we not be able to apply it as a law, but we have to evaluate those instances first by some standard, and that standard is what he's aiming at. So he isn't like he wouldn't like kids' books that teach him yeah, moral teach lesson. like a little moral lesson. They would teach a moral lesson, and I think he'd be fine with that. But he says this this can't be the thing that establishes morality. I can't point to those kids' book and say this is where morality comes from. I would say this is teaching rudimentary examples of, of, of morality, but it is not the principle on, upon which morality stands. Okay. okay, so I'm going to skip that part about practical philosophy. We are jumping to talking about the will a little bit. So the, I, I don't know if I need to define the will. He basically just says it is nothing but practical reason, right? It's, it's us doing a thing and it's putting reason into effect. But our wills are not perfect, right? So our reason tells us something is good. Our wills say, I see that. But I don't want to. Also, I, do, I might be influenced by something else, right? right? I have all these other things that are kind of pushing me around. Maybe I feel like I you know, want a little bit more money or I don't really feel like going out on a rainy day to help people. And I'd, I'd give that homeless man my soup, but I really like this soup. And yeah, so we have these imperfect wills, which which gives the groundwork for even the requirement of a law, right? So this is why we need laws, is to compel us, to give us a must or a commandment, a, an imperative that constrains the will. So there's a few types of imperatives. I don't need to know that I need to go into all of those, but I think it's interesting when he talks about a, an imperative or these laws as they apply to God. So listen to this. A perfectly good will would thus be would be just as much subject to objective laws, the laws of the good, but it could not for that reason be thought to be constrained to act lawfully, since by its own subjective constitution it can be moved only by the concept of the good. Hence, no imperatives hold for the divine will, or more generally, for a holy will. The must is here out of place, because the willing is already of itself necessary in agreement with the law. So God is subject to the laws, but he is not constrained by them because sure. his will is always in accord with the good. And therefore there is no must, there is no compulsion, there is no constrainment, right? Because his will is always completely, perfectly in line with what those laws require for the good. I buy it. And uh, I'm, it's a topic we've come to before that like, I think, I think Graham might've raised this last episode of like the 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 goodness of an action isn't how difficult it is to do it. It's like a faithfulness to what is good in the first place. And that's similar to what you're talking about of like the consistency between what God does and the goodness that God wills. Like those can be aligned. There doesn't have to be a difficulty there for it to still be a moral position. So that makes sense. I buy it. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. I'm, I'm, I'm absorbing. Okay. Still tracking? Still We're still tracking. doing okay? Still tracking. He's I don't feel like we've gotten to anything particularly... He's waiting to jump on something later. Yeah, I'm hoping he does. Okay. I'm really waiting for the, the point where Graham gets cranky. Um, okay, the next thing he does is sort of define and separate the different types of imperatives. And I'm sorry, this is going to be a little technical and maybe a little bit boring, but eventually we're going to get to interesting stuff, and that, that I think will make Graham angry. At least I'm hoping. Um, is there a way we can jazz it up? Can we, like, imagine Kant is, like, 
in a bathing suit or something? Why would you? Why Ooh. would you say that? Uh, why? No. Or no, we can't. Or if if the last chapter is indeed a, a catalog of cats, what would be like cat philosopher names? Wait, so say it again. Sorry, I was trying. I was trying. To, I was honestly trying to think of a way to jazz this up. Emmanuel Kant. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I hate this so much. I hate everything. Uh, you're welcome. That's the only one I have. That's terrible. Uh, it was your idea. <laughs> Fair point. Um, no, we can do the boring thing. No, I'm, I'm now. I'm just trying to think of cat philosopher names. Emmanuel Kant was so Emmanuel good. Emmanuel Kant okay, is pretty good. You're welcome. Um, I want to keep talking about this man. Let's 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 keep doing the philosophy. Okay. okay. All right. So maybe I can maybe I can separate these. Maybe I'll try to jazz it up. I don't know. We'll see if it works. So types of imperatives. There is a hypothetical imperative, which is good for an end. So it is saying, if I want this thing, I must do this thing. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Yes. And there's two types of this. There's those for a possible end, something I might get, maybe. I might get it. Um, and that's called a problematic practical principle or good for an actual end, right? So there's, there's a possible, this, this may or may not be real for me, and then there's an actual. This is, if I do this, I am aiming at some practical actual end. That's called an assertoric practical principle. Um, then there is, so those are hypothetical imperatives. Then there's a categorical imperative, which is objectively necessary without reference to any end. There's no goal. It is simply hmm. something you must do. Okay. This is called an apodictic practical principle. Man, that's a mouthful. Okay. Then he goes on to discuss... I know you're not supposed to, but can you give an example of that? Or are examples unhelpful? Because uh, he just said last chapter we can't give examples. No, I think in this we can. Oh. So a hypothetical, a one for a possible end... No, no, the one that was the categorical. That one would be something you do because it is good... It, any any act of strict morality, I okay. think, would ca- count gotcha. as right. as this. So tra- I'm grokking. No, def- I'm, I don't know if I'm grokking. I'm tracking. It is. Um, if say a woman is, I mean, I guess you could say it is. It is for the end of helping the woman. Um, that would. Let's see. I'm trying to think of one that is simply a duty that you must do without view to some end. Give to charity. But I guess the end there is helping charity. Oh, but. Saving a child from a burning building. Yeah, like you should just do that no matter what. Isn't that the categorical um, part of it? So here's, I think, a good example that's going to come up later. Not commit suicide, even though it would make my life easier. No, it would make your life done. No, no, no. Committing suicide would prevent me from the sorrows that I know are certainly going to come, oh. right? But it is something I must not do. Gotcha. Right? So, so that, I think, would count as a... Here, a categorical imperative. Okay, but, but you said that's one he'll come back to later. Yeah, that, okay. that's one of the four examples he's going to use to sort of illustrate his principle. Okay. So he goes on to talk about happiness, and this is where our, our discussion from last time about happiness comes back in. He says, happiness is one end that all men aim at. It is an actual end, real human happiness. So this counts as, like I said, an assertoric practical principle. It's hypothetical, right? It's aimed at an end, and there is a real actual end there, human happiness. And so prudence, the, the virtue of prudence, is the skill of choosing the means to one's own greatest well-being. Um, but we don't really know what is going to make us happy. So we're going to come, come back to that. So virtue. we kind of... Huh? Virtue. Maybe. Let's find out. Sort of. We're coming back to it. Just wait. So then he sort of summarizes the three. So there are rules of skill, um, which is aiming to an actual end that we can... Totally go for every time. Like, I know that I bang this hammer, that nail's going to go in there, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's not even necessarily whether the end is good or bad. It's just how do I get to this particular end? Then there are the counsels of prudence, which, which cannot command us. And I'll, I'll ex- explain a little more why in a second. And then there's the laws of morality, which are apodictic. So rules of skill doesn't even worry if it's good or, good or bad. It's simply a question of how do I get this thing? We teach kids le- stuff like this all the time in school, right? So they're in school. They get taught if things are like how to accomplish, say, bisecting a square, Mm -hmm. right? There's no question of whether it is good at the moment that they're doing it. It's just how to do a thing. Mm -hmm. And you're preparing them to pursue some future good. Yeah, bisecting all sorts of squares. That is a skill, right? That's that's an imperative of skill. Yes. Then there are the, and so those don't really command us, right? They're not telling us to do anything. There's not even any claim of good or bad. Then there are the counsels of prudence. And these also do not command us. 
The goal here is our human happiness, but the problem is we don't actually always know what is going to make us happy. We could think that health is going to make us happy, but it's actually our sickness that keeps us from falling into other types of excess. We think it's money that's going to make us happy, but we get a lot of money and then we become selfish and protective and then we have a lot of nerves. And so money isn't actually doing the job and that's not going to work for us. We think that, you know, maybe a relationship is going to make us happy, but that doesn't make us like, so that's the point is real human flourishing. We don't always know what it looks like. So while it is an actual end, it is an end of the imagination. And so the counsels of prudence, how to be happy, do not have the same kind of command that a categorical imperative does, because we, we don't know if it will actually end in complete human flourishing. Does that make sense? It does. But it, it, isn't the problem that he's trying to be too precise about it? Can't we talk about, like, normative happiness? Like, we, we, we have studies on this. Who's that? Uh, Arthur Brooks, mm-hmm. right? Like, Arthur Brooks uh, did the famous happiness study at Harvard. Was it Harvard? I Yale? think it's Harvard. One of yeah. them. You know, where we're, we're, we're talking about sort of the, the self-reporting of people's happiness in life, and he can, he can normatively break it down to a different kind, to a bunch of different kinds of categories, right? Meaningful work, a group of friends, and framework for death. Like you, know, like you sort of have these overarching categories, and we would have sort of, you know, the, you would be able to make statements about normative human happiness. Maybe is is Kant? Um, he would support that, but he would say so. Give, give me your list again of things that lead to happiness. Um, this, this is the Arthur Brooks position. What was it? It was like meaningful work. Okay. Um, uh, uh, people who genuinely love you. So like like people who are who rejoice, people who take pleasure in your pleasure and, and are also pain in your pain. And then uh, uh, and then I think framework for death. For death, yeah. Was like, another one. There may be a third one in there, but I can't but remember. But could you imagine someone having those three things and not still being happy? Can people have meaningful work and not be happy? Can people have <laughs> I know, close friends? Yes, death yeah. close I think friends. so. Yeah. But I, but what Kant seems to be doing is he wants to say, okay, well, if I can imagine somebody who has those things and isn't happy, that must mean that there's happiness a, lo- a layer else. below that. Yeah. And I, my point is, um, you, you go down that like he's gonna he's gonna keep going those layers below, and he's actually gonna get to a place where he can't come up with a category that's gonna cover everybody. Um, um, but you, you go up a layer and you have a framework that you can work with. So it's kind of like chemistry, right? You, you, at the atomic level, you can make predictions about what the compounds are going to Mm -hmm. do or about what the the elements are going to do. You go a layer below and you get into this realm of chaos and you cannot make predictions about what they're going to do, but you go back to, oops, you go back to the layer above it and you can. So I'm just wondering if, if he's going to, if he's just like, trying to go to the subatomic level of happiness and is going to be like, can't find it here. I don't think so. I think what he is trying to do is set us up for the, his formulations of the categorical imperative and why they work. Because um, mm-hmm. he's about to go into some pretty heady stuff on here's, uh, here's why they actually work the way they do. And he's trying to separate those from the counsels of prudence. And he says the counsels of prudence, you're, you're right, that there are meta levels of here are things that will make us happy. And I think he recognizes that. But he's pointing out that if I said, Graham, you need to, I don't know, start running every day and get healthy, mm. right? Watch your mouth. So <laughs> that, that wouldn't be a, an, an absolute command, right? Because it might turn out that you get healthy, but running every day means that you have to neglect your wife and your dog and you don't actually do the yard work that you're supposed to do and she starts to resent you and it ruins your other relationship. So it is a counsel of prudence. But it is not yeah. an absolute imperative command, an yeah. absolute duty, like, you must follow this or you are in the moral wrong. It is simply an indication of how you will probably become happy. But you don't know that it will absolutely make you become happy, so it doesn't have the same command that a, that an, again, a categorical imperative would. It is merely a counsel of prudence. If you start running every day, you will probably be happier. So then isn't everything a counsel of prudence because everything is in some sort of context? Sort of, but it's, it's, those are the ones where you are aiming at a specific end and that specific end is making you happy, Mm -hmm. right? And he's trying to separate that from a moral categorical imperative, which is this maxim, if carried out by all men is a good. Because in this example, all times on all circumstances, yeah, be closer to saying that the maxim is like all, all people should be healthy, right? But that's not necessarily true. 
But well, that's like, what I mean. What is it? But what then we'd it? go back and forth and say, well, actually, it should be, uh, you know, some people are born with conditions and they can't be like healthy. So, like, uh, to the best of their ability, they should eat well and have some kind of exercise. But that's different than saying everyone should run. That's the prudential part. Is that, am I separating yeah, this the I, right way? I think so. Yeah. Um, I, I think he's just sort of setting us up for, for his next, like, real jumps into his formulations of the categorical imperative as separate from just like, here's a thing that will probably make us. Feel better, right? Exactly. Is right? the categorical imperative going to be everyone should have goodwill? Mm, uh, no. Okay. I mean, we already have the categorical imperative. What is it? That you must always act in such a way that the maxim that is guiding your action should apply universally to all men. No, no, or, no, no. Sorry, that's, all that's just another beings. definition of categorical imperative. Like, what's the well, actual that, that thing? That is, is the, the categorical imperative. imperative. So, what do you so? And, but I can't ask for an example, or I can't. No, you can't. He's going to give examples. Oh, okay. So, for example, and this, uh, I'll, I'll give a little bit more to this later. Say there's a guy whose life is pretty terrible, and he's he's considering committing suicide, mm-hmm. right? Um, his principle is that I can shorten my life in order to improve it, mm-hmm. right? Well, he can't. He can't really apply that widely because built into that is a contradiction. Right, the mechanism that should improve life is therefore ending it. Well, he's not improving his life, and that's the thing. That that's yeah. that's the point. Is it's a contradiction. He no, cannot he cannot extend that maxim as a universal law to all no, men. No, 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 not even not even that. It's not that it's a contradiction. It's just that he's wrong. That's a contradiction. That's a contradiction. No, but it, but Kant's saying he's wrong because he can't extend that to everybody in the world. He's wrong, but for that's other not reasons. the reason why he's wrong. He's also wrong just because. Okay, it's, sure. Uh, the second okay. example, and I'll we'll, I'll come back to these and maybe give them a little more length. Is there's a guy who owes some money and he wants to. Or he, he, he wants to borrow some money, and the guy's like, you're going to pay it back, right? And he has the option of lying. Lie, He's yeah. obviously not going to pay it back. Yep. And he could lie, right? So his maxim is, if I really want the money, I can tell a false... If I really want something, I can tell a falsehood to get it for, for the moment. Well, if we applied that universally to all men, no one would ever even lend, lend any, money, yeah. and no one would ever promise. Yeah. And so it would destroy the very mechanism of trying to borrow. But we can think of contexts where lying to somebody in order to get their money to do something would be a good. Because what you'll do with the money is because so Because what good. you'll do with the money is great, or the person that you're getting money so, from is like a that, giant dirtbag. But that might change the maxim. If you're like getting the Nazis to loan you money and you give but it that to the might, resistance. But that might change the maxim. All men should... Lie to bad people. Lie to bad people in order to get money to help good people. Oh, so we can just keep changing the maxim to make it work? That's if what we it's a different, so- if it's yeah. a different circumstance. Oh, cool. All right. So then, I don't know how this is going to be a helpful. You added a di- You asked. Why are you you like asked this? for an Literally, example. Why? What I are gave you, doing? you an example. No, but I'm just saying that, like, but if the example is okay, whatever. I, I just, I just don't see how this is a little, a little rule we can carry around with us that's helpful. Well, hold on. We'll get there. Okay, but the, there. the yeah. point is that that is the categorical imperative yeah. that you have to. And this is where I think we found a little trouble last time was that there is some level of, of abstraction here where you have to identify the maxim yeah. by which you are acting. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's fair. You do have to sort of identify the maxim. And that that needs a little bit of, of groundwork. But he says, this is the thing. You identify the maxim and then ask, can I apply this universally to all rational beings in all contexts? And, and not only can I, but is it possible for me to will that that would happen okay. as, a, as a good? And he's going to say that there is situations where the answer to that is yes. That there are there are maxims that you can say this is something that everybody should do. Yeah, yes. that, that's morality. Yeah. He's saying that that morality is that that that's the categorical imperative. And so the the reason you were like I would like an example is because it has to be separate. Like that categorical imperative, he wants the a priori because it has to be separate from examples. Right? We cannot derive our morality from examples. He says this is like the only thing that can work a priori. And it's simply that whatever you are acting by must be something you can will to apply for all men. Are okay. you wondering why we need to universalize these things? I'm just wondering why. What what's helpful to have something that says, "Hey, here's a categorical imperative. Um, we can't use examples to define it, but it's going to be self. It's going to be defined by itself. And if you try to apply it to different examples, your examples can change it, with, which nullifies it. No, it doesn't just, nullify. Yeah. It doesn't nullify the the examples. We'll get back to it. But here, here's here's why. Here's why, like what his project is. It's because everyone is making a whole lot of statements about morality, but they don't actually have a a solid base. Like they're all standing on sand. No, they're standing in the Tao. Yes, but he's saying this is where the Tao comes from. Right? There are people who would call the Tao, and, and even C.S. Lewis says this is just sort of the way things are. He's saying here's the rational basis for that thing. 
Yeah. Because that's what his intro said, is that there's kind of this like standard morality that just like everyday people have. Let's, yeah. let's give this a rational basis. And that's what the project is right now. Yeah. Right. Otherwise, you could just say no. A- anything. Yes, exactly. And right. then what's your response? It's, it's, we've always done it this way. And that's not a satisfying answer to Kant, right? Isn't, yeah. that, isn't that where this whole project comes and from? And so he's saying here is, here is establishing it on a rational basis. Yeah. Without this, any sort of trans, like a rational and with, whether with or not no it's appeal. transcendent doesn't matter. Yeah. Like as long as we can have it be a standalone on its, on, on its rational basis. Yeah. It, it's enough. not derived from examples, which yeah. means I'm, it's, it is pure and therefore it, it, can abstract, be, it can be extracted from the world. It can be extracted from the world, which means, which means, and that sounds, sounds bad, but it means that we can apply it widely to any situation. It applies for all rational beings. We don't have to talk humans. It should always be good. Yeah. Seems to me like a good thing. It, it does. It seems like there are a lot of assumptions that go into that, that someone can come up with something that is universally applicable. So I don't know. I, like, I want to hear more of his argument because yeah. I'm wondering why he, because ultimately he's going to say that he has access to these laws, right? No, that, that all men have access to these laws. He'll say all rational people, which will could mean people who agree with him, right? Well, again, I just want to hear more of what he has okay. to say. All right. Well, yeah. I'm, 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 I know. I love it because the thing you're asking for, he absolutely gives. I'm thankful. Good. So here are his, his formulations of the categorical imperative. All right. So hold on. I'm, on, I'm at a grouch six. So grouch six? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. We haven't we'll hit grouch nine. 10 yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah we got nine, time. Not there. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's okay. We still have to talk about things. So the, the, he says, we cannot prove the laws possible with examples, so we must do it a priori. So the categorical imperative establishes itself by its form is his claim. So that's one thing. He's, he's got to find some sort of ground for this to yep. say this is actually the thing. And we can't prove it with examples, so we have to do it somehow, somehow else. And I'm going to read you this, this section. Um, three types. Let me pull it up here. How is the categorical imperative possible? Okay. One of my favorite things is that your notes are in red, which makes it look like you're proofreading Kant. And it's like, no, we can phrase this better. Okay. So if I think of a hypothetical imperative as such, so hypothetical imperative means going after some end, I do not know beforehand what it will contain, not until I am given its condition. So if I think of like a hypothetical comparative, right. uh, imperative, it's, it's going for something. I don't know what it's going for until I'm given its condition, yep. right? But if I think of a categorical imperative, I know right away what it contains, right? Because it's not aiming for an end. There's, there's no condition for it. For since this imperative contains besides the law only the necessity that the maxim conform to this law, while the law, as we have seen, contains no condition limiting it, there is nothing left over to which the maxim of the action should conform except the universality of a law as such. And it is only this conformity that the imperative asserts to be necessary. There is therefore only one categorical imperative because all the others, oh. all the hypotheticals are aiming at some end. Some, yeah. This one is not aiming at an end. All it is is commanding and it must be a universally fo- followed command. Um, so there aren't separate moral laws. There's one law. There's one, one imperative. One imperative. It is this. Act only on that maxim by which you can at the same time will, not just conceive of it happening, oh, but will that it should become a universal law. So act only on those principles that you can actively say, yes, all of men should do this. Not right. just the, can they do it, but we all should be doing this thing. That is the only categorical imperative. There's only one and its very form suggests it. Yeah. Following so far. I'm following it. I want, I want Grumpy Graham. I want. I just don't think it's helpful. I just think like if you have that as your rule and then you're in, and you're in a circumstance or a situation, the context of that circumstance or situation is always going to give you your ne- like go back to the borrowing money from Nazis or whatever. All right. So like, you're just going to keep extending or you're, you're going to be saying like, OK, should I say that everybody on like in the, in the month of March should be doing this and um, should be doing this like you know, at this interest rate for this amount of time with like, you know, in with this person, like at some point, the the whole context is going to get so big that. But that but then it's not a maxim. You've 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 made it into a situation, right? You are no longer having a principle of action, but you are having you are looking at the very action itself. So, yes, he doesn't hasn't yet given any sort of guideline for how abstracted you need to be. But there is some extraction, um, 
some abstraction necessary in order for you to arrive at a maxim. So there so, is some maxim of action. And it's that maxim that he's getting at that you should like abstract it from your situation. So take out the reference of the month of March, take out the reference to like David, take out all those references that a man like you should do su- such a thing to another man in this case and will that all men should do that thing. So here's an example. This is maybe a stupid example. So Amanda and I, my wife, we've been watching the the new version of the All Creatures Great and Small television show. What is that? Uh, it's a it's a TV show about uh, a small like 1940s, late 30s, early 40s small town vet. Okay. And he lives in York in the Yorkshire Dales, and he's a little vet to all these farmers and their cows and whatnot. Um, World War II is starting, and he feels like he should go off and fight in war. And he has a protected job because he's a vet, and they mm. need him to stay at home to like do tuberculosis tests on TB tests on the cattle so that people don't get TB in their milk. And um, and he's got this protected job because he's a small town vet, and they need him to like you know help the war effort. And you know he's sort of conflicted because he wants to go off and fight in war, and he also uh, has, you know feels like he's got this duty to stay at home and do this thing, but he feels sort of like he's letting people down because they're going off and doing the fighting. And so there's the example. Um, uh, how does the maxim help him make a decision whether he should go fight in war or stay at home? So what is the maxim of action he is, he is adhering to? It sounds to me like the maxim is every man should fight with his best abilities to support a war effort in his home country. And in that case, it does help him make a decision. What is his better ability? Is it fighting or is it being a vet? But it depends. I mean, he, he could go off and be the one whose bullet killed Hitler then he should go to the war, the war front. And he's no, the no, war- but that's but that's 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 an unhelpful if then. Why? That well, that's about the end, and which the whole point here is not to consider the end. Not it's, consider the end. It's, it's to consider the- what should all people do. Should all people go to war to the extent that they're physically able, or should they not? So right. should. But the should, thing is, so, so here, even just putting in that way, you can say there's so many different like there's so many different other elements of the context that you need to have in order to be able to make that decision. No, uh, but I, 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 I disagree. So take, take a few of the maximums of action. If the, if the maxim is all men should go and fight for their country when there is a war effort, I think you cannot will that that is true of all men. No, there are some that right. should stay home, right. some that are valuable at home. Right. Should all men stay home and do their jobs during a war effort? No. No. So the maxim by, by which you must act is all men should provide their best use in a war effort. In this case, for him, like, it is probably wait, at wait, home being wait, a vet. You, you said what? All men should... No, no, no. What was, the, what was the adjective? It is probably. But we're not talking about probables. We're talking about, we're talking about a maxim that we have to follow. We don't know if he's going to be better being a vet no, no. or being a soldier. That's the problem. You're but, bringing ends back into it. Because he, he should look at... So, so, so yes. I, I said probably, but what I mean is the maxim by which he is acting is or should act, is all men should provide their best use to their country when that country is at war. And his question shouldn't be, will I accidentally kill Hitler? It's, am I currently a better fighter than I am a vet? Can I serve better as a fighter, or can I serve better as a vet? And it's probably as a vet. He should probably stay home. Uh, How is that not considering ends? Uh, Because the principle applies to everyone equally, that we should give our best impact. And therefore he has to apply it. And I will say also, this might not be the right maxim. Like the point here is that you then have to go back and forth to find what is the actual principle we want to live by. I think AJ sounds reasonable, but maybe if you have a different formulation, maybe we should use a different one. Um, so the maxim is all people should serve the war effort. What? To the best of their, what was it? The best of their abilities? Uh, should provide their, yeah, their best, of, like, follow their best abilities and provide their best use to, to any war, war effort in their home country. Yeah. Someone comes to him and says, hey, listen, man, like, we can easily teach an old man to do TB testing on the cows, and we need every able-bodied soldier that we have. And he's like, okay, that helps make my decision. Someone else comes to him and says, like, listen, um, you've been doing this already for a long time. You know how to do this. Uh, um... Uh, uh, you can get through more cows on TB testing. You can get through, you can help this community way more than an old person can. Like, you should stay here and do it. And he's like, oh, that sounds reasonable. And, and, and he still doesn't have a decision to make. Not one of those is more reasonable. He, he will know as the person who works with the cows whether or not he can easily, easily teach someone to do his job just as quickly. That's something he will know. Can I teach someone to do my job just as well as I do it or am I going to be a better fighter? How long would it take me to, re- to replace myself? I should know. I know how hard it's going to be to replace myself as, as a 9th grade English teacher. 
and how I'm much just and saying can that I the, serve better in that no, capacity? No, I'm just saying that the, that this categorical imperative framework has not made his decision any easier. I think it's clarified like it the has. issue. Yeah, to say. and there's still something like, okay, he stays behind and he works and he does his, you know, he stays behind, and he does his duty. And um, so, so in this case, maybe, maybe it would help clarify. Well, let's say if his I said, dad's real disappointed in him. So in this case, maybe it would clarify to say that he is doing his duty either way. In both instances, he is serving his country. And the point of the point of the categorical imperative is to sort of identify duty, right? Yeah, it's a difficult decision. Yes, he, like he is willing that all men should provide their best use. I think the identifying the immoral immoral act mm-hmm. here would be I do neither. Mm. Sure. That's, what Fine, I was, that's easy. I was about to ask that of, is he actually facing a moral question per se? Because it seems like the it, fact he's questioning this and is open to serving his country means he's not on the immoral side. Yeah, of it. either but, one Either one will be right and not wrong. Yes. I don't know. Well, you, we, earlier you were just arguing that he should know whether that he, sh- that he should be serving to his best of his abilities. Let's say that it would be better for Britain that he stays and he fights, or he stays and he does his duty as a vet. And yet he just can't shake the idea of going off with his brother and he goes off and he fights. We look at him and say, oof, you made the wrong choice there, bucko. Uh, I don't point. think we could ever look at him and say he made an immoral choice. That's the thing. So, so then how is this a helpful moral category, moral framework? Because because this question because this question is, is, is a practical question, not a moral one. I was one. gonna say it falls in that prudential category that Kant already has. So this is a yeah, this is a question of like the councils of prudence, not is this a a moral issue. And even in talking with others to say that we're not, you know, this isn't a, you are a bad person for making one choice or another. It is a, we think your impact will be better here or somewhere else. It, it changes the tone of conversation to have it, whether it's you are moral or immoral, or we agree with you or we disagree with you. It, it That's the categorization this provides. Again, it just does not feel like the categorical imperative ends up being a, like helpful. It, so again, I'm not sure his goal is to say, let this pop up into your mind. And I mean, like, right. there are rare occasions where it will help you make a moral decision. But I don't think it's a keep this in mind and run everything. I think he, what he's trying to do partially is establish a from this we can start to derive rules. I, I see him moving. Right, don't, be, don't be attacking I'm not, I'm it. There's nothing to attack yet. Can I say the part that I, I, I think that Graham is saying that I do agree with? Sure. Is that I think Kant is Thank making you. moral disagreements sound more sound easier to discuss than they actually are in that like you read Kant and you think we're going to come up with a hundred rules that uh, all men should live by, but actually we can't come up with any, we can't come. Well, or we actually need a hundred thousand or whatever. Yeah. Like, we, yes. We either need, we haven't rules to cover every context yeah. or like we haven't sidestepped the difficult issue of like people have to live in a context. And so, uh, moral issues are still more complicated than Kant is making them sound. And I think that's what Graham is saying. Fair. I, I, I agree with that part. Yeah, I let, I'll, I'll say that's fair. But I, again, I don't think his goal here is to say, and now that I've established this, here are a thousand rules for life. Right. Like I, That's not what he's doing. What yeah. he's doing is giving you f- somewhere to stand when you say we should follow a moral law. Yeah. I think that's his goal. But not here is a thing that's helpful for the moral law. I think he's trying to say here's something you can stand on and say the moral law should be followed. But in our vet example, like I think what Graham brought in that was helpful is so we were focused on the should he go to war or not. We was also in a family. And so if we had a maxim that said children should listen to the input of their parents, right? Well, what if those are in conflict? Then we need a new maxim to say how do we order all these different rules that we have, right? Is that a part of what you're getting at? Yeah. I mean, my, my ultimate worry is that Kant is doing a, a program where he's trying to get a basis for moral um, a basis for moral action that – that can stand on its own two feet apart from any relationship to God. That's what he wants. He's like, God could exist or could not exist, doesn't matter, because we can have a, we can have a, uh, a rational basis for our moral action, and that's the sort of the firm foundation that we can build everything off of. And you're right in saying that people read Kant and they say, awesome, here's the rational project we can do to create a rational morality using this, you know, the a priori, um, you know, fixed point of the universe and then build everything on top of that. And then I just think when you run it in real life circuit situations, you just get Kant finger wagging being like, ah, 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 this needs, you know, uh, uh, you're putting too much context in it. This needs, we need to go back to the, to the moral, to the categorical imperative in order to build everything off. But of it. And at some point it's like, this isn't very helpful. But that's a good thing, right? Like wouldn't like, 
aren't aren't those in, those pieces of context kind of blinding you to what is the moral question at hand? Like, isn't there something useful to getting down to the first principles of, well, should I be brave or should I be cowardly? If it's the case of should I go to war or should I like dodge the draft or whatever? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, there's there are ways where context actually obfuscates the situation as opposed to clarifying it, and that's what Kant's project is: is to say. What's like the rational basis for how we make these decisions? Let's get to that before we talk about the context. And keep in mind that he hasn't so far abandoned the divine. He has just no, talked right. about, he, but he's again. just talked about like how the divine will isn't constrained. Yeah, he doesn't abandon divine, but he's 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 trying to do a project where it it uh, whether God is part of the program or not, it doesn't actually ultimately matter because it it comes down to re- a reasonable a reason alone basis for morality. But I, I think that's putting motives. In a, in a man where that's not necessarily the motive. I think he was looking at other people trying to establish mor- morality by saying, here are some examples of people doing awesome things. Therefore, morality. Yeah. And he's like, we can't, we can't do that. It doesn't serve as a reason to do it. And even if we want certain things, like human happiness, like he's like, that doesn't even quite, quite work as a basis for morality. He's trying... Uh, take, for example, right now, we're, we're in relativism, right? Like global moral relativism, that your rel- your morals are completely relative to where you set up. And so basically, moral relativism has no purchase on our lives whatsoever. He is trying to partially counteract that. He says, here is a basis, right? right? There is a reason why we should follow these moral laws. And I don't think he's a completely abandoned the divine. I, I, I'm with you in that this can result in an abandonment of the divine. And there's actually one point where I will take beef with one of his conclusions because he doesn't really give very much basis for it. Maybe I'm misunderstanding it, but in that place, I think, is where the abandonment of God comes and where God could be reinserted. But we're not there yet. That's fine. Can mm-hmm. I continue? Sure. Okay. Yes, of course. So, now the examples. <laughs> That's funny. So he does give four examples of ways that this kind of works out in the real world. The first man is the suicide. I've already kind of referenced him. So a man feels sick of life as the result of a mounting series of misfortunes that has reduced him to hopelessness. But he still possesses enough of his reason to ask himself whether it would not be contrary to his duty to to himself to take his own life. Is it contrary to duty is the question. Now he tests whether the maxim of his action could really become a universal law of nature. His maxim, however, is I make it my principle out of self-love to shorten my life if its continuance threatens more evil than it promises advantage. The only further question is whether the principle of self-love can become a universal law of nature. But one sees at once that a nature whose law was that the very same feeling meant to promote life should actually destroy life would contradict itself, and hence would not endure as nature, a law of nature. The maxim, therefore, could not possibly be a general law of nature, and thus it wholly contradicts the supreme principle of all duty. So his question is, can I, following duty, take my own life? And the answer is no, because then the impulse meant to preserve life would be destroying it, and that cannot be a universal law, right? Because, I'm sorry, because it lacks reason, because of the contradiction? Because of the, I mean, because of the contradiction. Okay. Yeah. So like the, no, the, uh, the Roman centurion who loses the war and kills himself so he doesn't get captured? That's a different issue. Because it's not, it's not the same feeling that is meant to promote, promote life that is ending it. it is, he is trying to save others. Roman centurion, like, if I'm a Roman centurion, I know all the plans of my army. If I'm captured, I can be used as a ransom against my family. There are other people at play here than just my own malaise with the world. Roman centurion suicide was an act of practicality in many situations. So, does Kant say you can kill yourself or not? Depends. Yes, that's, that's my point. Okay. It depends. Yeah. So what's the ca- how is the category comparative helpful if everything we get to is Because it this guy had a question. Is it dutiful to kill my life, to kill myself or not? He's not a Roman centurion. Those things don't factor in. Mm-hmm. That principle, his maxim, would not apply to a Roman centurion. You're pointing mm-hmm. out that there are different moral situations. Agreed. Okay. But this moral maxim wouldn't apply to the centurion. You don't think we're then getting back to the context determines the morality of a situation? I mean, context has, and I has, of course, context matters in in discussions of morality but when the same principle is at play you can you can think of okay what is the maxim that is guiding my action is it something that Mm. i would will all men to do or not right and okay like for example if i was talking to somebody who thought like i don't take no crap from no one and when somebody sasses me i punch them in the neck right or i kill them right what i would ask can you will that all men should be exactly the same and then we can get to an actual discussion of okay is it my duty to punch a man in the neck if he sasses me yeah 
The answer is no. I'm assuming the answer is no to that one. Yeah, but I mean, oh. it's, I feel like it's going to be a conversation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but and, and then if we say, but there are times where punching someone in the neck for sass is warranted, then the retort is, well, now you're talking about a different context. Or a different maxim, or I guess. Or a different maxim. But I, I would, if, I mean, if it's if he's just sassing me and then I'm punching him in the neck, like if it's just sass. If he, no, if he, if, he, if he is continuously sassing you all day and he's bullying you and that kind of thing. But that's a different... Exactly. This is this, that, so, this is Graham's point. Yeah, and that's fine. I'm like, like yeah. yes, there are there are different contexts, but there are a lot of contexts that are very similar and act on the same maxim. So basically, how his, many people have? So have his point thought, is: take your context, look at it, and ask yourself whether it's right or wrong. Not, no, no. Ask yourself whether you the can principle. universalize the action. Yes, the the maxim by which you're acting. But yeah, that's the question. Can and, I universalize the action? And if I can't universalize the action, I probably shouldn't do it. Um. And uh, so then I'm assuming that, you know, you take two twins in identical circumstances, they should come to identical conclusions about what to do because we're universalizing the action. Is that right? And all reasonable people have access to this idea, yeah. right? To this maxim. So if, you know, there's two bummed out twins and they're both, and they both are the, in the suicide um, and um, they have the exact same sort of situations and, and circumstances except for the obvious ones like they exist in different points of the room at any given time they exist in different you know countries at any given time because one's in canada and one's in the united states regardless of that we can say they sh- you know they should follow the same categorical imperative of not killing themselves because yeah. we've universalized that action yeah Re- well i mean that, not that we've you know, but they they can answer the question so should I, all should i can i will that all men should do this and so then no. at what point does the context change so much that we're going to be giving them the different conclusions to the different actions to do when the maxim that is guiding their action is is different okay and then how do we know that when the maxim is guiding their action is different like i guess we the question is can they universalize it like as soon as we identify the maxim that is guiding the action the question is can i will that all men should do this yeah it's a different context sure it's changed it's changed the maxim but then my next question is okay this is a different maxim different situation can i will that all men should do this if they hit this same situation. Where I'm at right now is I think he's correct, but I, 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 I don't, I'm not quite settled on it, which is why I'm fighting it. Okay, yeah, uh, that's fine. I also, like, a lot of this stuff kind of rings pretty true mm-hmm. that I'm kind of on board for most of it. I like the intention and I like the, I, like, I want to think that uh, reason is the way to handle all these problems. I just don't know. These are Graham's questions. I don't know if in practice that's how it works, but... I, li- I like the intention of let's solve this the right way instead of just how I feel, right? But the thing is, I just think of if I have a 15-year-old student what's the mo- and, and they're wrestling with a moral issue, I'm trying to think of what would be the, what, what advice is actually going to engage their willpower. Is it going to be universalize the principle or do the right thing? And I feel like telling someone to be like, be a man and do the right thing engages you know, the willpower of a 15-year-old Ooh. boy other than let's, you know, extract this and, and sort of talk about this in terms of, you know, this sort of cold scientific experiment of universalizing this principle and, saying, and then saying like, well, because we've universalized this principle, all rational mod, uh, men ought to, to do this thing. Oh, yeah. I don't, I don't think this is meant as a motivator. The funny thing yeah. is he actually talks about it as a motivator. Yeah, it's like funny. nothing could have greater purchase on a student's will. And I was like, I th- okay, hard miss on that one, <laughs> mm-hmm. funny. granted. But, okay, for, for example, a student of mine that I tutor had a... Had a a moral question in one of her papers that she was writing about Socrates. Mm-hmm. And this girl had, she was in a text chat and somebody had sent some inappropriate images. And so, so she was wondering, what is the appropriate action? What is my duty, right? Should I leave the chat? Should I confront them? Or should I report the chat, right? Three possible actions, right? And so the question here is we figure out the maximum and we universalize it. And so sitting down with this person, there I feel like it actually is a pretty good question. What is your duty here? Would you will that, what would you want everyone to do in the circumstance? Exactly. Yeah. What would you want? That's a great question. Can you will that everyone would do the same thing? Okay. Yeah. Can you will that everyone would report every Im- inappropriate image in every single chat that's ever been? Well, probably not. That would mean that some people that got in trouble that might not need to be in trouble. There'd be a whole lot of hubbub that we might not necessarily need. Could Wait, you why? Wi- why not? Why don't we? Well, do let's that? go through all three. Okay. Right. Isn't that the? Yeah. And then you say, okay, should you just leave the chat? Can you will that everyone should just ignore those those evil things that their friends are doing and try to separate themselves so they don't get any of the backlash when it comes back to hit them? Or can you will that everyone should confront their friends boldly when they have done something inappropriate and see if they can't help them, their friends out of the pit they're in? Yeah. 
I think the answer is clear that the third is the best one, that you would want everyone to confront their friends, stop them from the evil they're doing, and maybe not, you know, get them in trouble with the school and get them expelled because they did something that really didn't merit that kind of backlash. But this is my what point from before. They're not your friend. They're just yeah. sort of like someone you're in a group chat with. Because there's still disagreement here. So, like, we you can still will that that would be what would be done universally, but you haven't solved the moral problem because then you have to actually figure out which one's the best of the three. Graham would think it's a different one. You think it's one. And the girl might have thought it's a different one, right? Oh, like, wait, well, so why, why does it not solve the problem? I, I, granted, we, so maybe if it's, if it's friends, it's a different thing than just acquaintances. Acquaint- I'm just saying posing the question, I think, is very helpful to be thinking in that context yeah. of what do you want everyone to do. But that problem hasn't gone away because I think Graham's instinct was that you should report it instead of the confronting. No, I was just saying why, why is not the universal reporting then not the... I mean, um, and then, and then the, this in, just in comes the, down to like what, what one's sense of justice and right. so so in the case, but that's so in this case it was we don't want to report because the the backlash might be an unjust reprisal for what has happened. Like they get in trouble, the school reports they don't go to college because they sent an inappropriate image one time, right? That's that's probably way too much backlash. You might be right in that they like getting adults involved, but there's also a friendship there to be considering, and so. Would you, I would will that all men confront their friends and try to stop their behavior before getting them in trouble with a higher power, which I think is consistent with scripture as well. But that's the universe. We can universalize that action that anybody, everybody should confront their friends before they can, for something immoral before they confront authorities. I'm I'm not necessarily for, for all immoral things, but for small immoral actions, yeah. Like, yeah, that, if that, the guy murdered a whole family, I'm definitely going to report it. Mm-hmm. I'm not just going to confront him first. Mm-hmm. But for a small transgression, I'm definitely going to confront my friend before I report and see if I can stop the behavior before I go report him to an authority. And that, and you're, you feel comfortable universalizing that action. Yeah. Hey, man, knock it off. It's not cool. Are you coming up with the alternative? I'm just thinking that if someone says, uh, no, this is, you know, um, my, my take on the seriousness of this, of the inappropriateness of this image is greater than your take on it. You think that this is a small thing. I think that this is a much bigger and vile thing. And I think that, it, that, um, then that, we that, that, the princi- that the higher punishment that's going to come by exposing this is warranted and justified. Then, then we've changed the principle of action, I think. The maxim by which that's guiding our principles. And again, so then... The, and. So then you and I are, so here's the problem. You and I are coming to different actions, right? Well, one of but the, both one of our, but we're coming to different actions, but both of us are saying where you, we have universalized yes. the principle. But yes, but we, the thing is we both agree on the universalized principle. Yeah, sure. Except when the context is now in front of us, we come to different, we come to different decisions on what to do. Sure. But we still have a basic guide for morality. <laughs> but, we, but we still have a basic guide for morality, but but given the exact same context, we're doing we're we're prescribing different things. We're prudently saying you should do something different. You mean like churches do? So you're saying we're no better off. With, I'm saying we're no better off with Kant's maxim of universalizing the particular universalizing. That's funny. The thing. I was saying that to AJ, but it's funny yeah. that you jumped on it because I guess you're both kind of saying that we haven't really advanced the ball morally, right? Like we're just kind of in the same spot of there are disagreements. They're kind of irreconcilable. Because you're cause, saying everybody should confront their friends before it becomes a big deal. And I'm saying everybody should stamp out, you know, um, vile images, and uh, everyone should expose should should uh, expose these things uh, uh, when there are impressionable kids in group chats, and this should be uh, ramped up to a much more serious thing. I'm not necessarily going to agree with this, but I'm just saying that there there would be people who for whom that would be their their conclusion, and they are saying that yes, definitely we should universalize this. And so the problem is Kant's given us the moral, the, the imperative, act in such a way that you universal that you can universalize this action, and I think your universalizing of this action is harsh, and you think this universalizing of my action is m- too merciful, and now we have a problem. That, that the Kant hasn't helped us. Uh, so so, uh, a few things. First, I think we might be talking about different maxims. Um, <laughs> uh, don't stop. Stop. Just let me let me finish. Okay. Granted, maybe we're not. And I actually agree with you that this is one of the problems that, that will eventually, I, I guess, next episode when I, when I finish this, yeah. um, I think that will close. eventually kind of come out is that not everyone comes to the same rational conclusion. Um, and that does present a problem for, for Kant's framework is that, yes, even with people who are incredibly intelligent, sometimes they don't come to the same conclusion about universalizing a maxim or not. Right. But I think his point is giving it actual real purchase that 
here is a duty that you are commanded to do. Mm -hmm. Like there is a rational basis for, yes, this is a duty. You should follow it. There's no disregarding this. And it's not just a principle of like a like oh, random circumstance. I can do it if I'm not like this is a universal command. You have to do this. And in that, I think we're in a decent place. Does that change people who derive that same groundwork from the divine? No, I think they're both in a place where they're standing on something firm. But hmm. let me let me frame it like this. Oh no, sorry, you were, you were done. But again, I don't think he is trying to give an. He's necessarily trying to give an easier method for discovering morality. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's his goal. I don't think it's like do this like one easy trick to to <laughs> to like. Make your yeah. life moral. Doctors hate when yeah. people... Yeah. yeah, he's trying to find an a priori groundwork for morality that isn't deriving it from examples so that we can say, yes, this is a universally, like, must-follow law. Okay, but... Um, so it doesn't have to be helpful, is what you're saying? But I don't think that's his goal. Okay. I don't think he's trying to, like, make a one easy trick to discover your morality. I don't think that's okay. what's happening. So, like, when you... So, okay, then, then my, my distinction is just going to bring us back to the to the to the circle we've been going not circle into the constructive uh, the circle. Like circle. Yeah, the no, circle. Not, yeah. no no because it is because it is getting us closer to the to the thing he's just so he's saying hey you know there are maxims that uh, behavior should be oh, man no, I, again i can't bring the context into it um it doesn't need to be helpful he's just trying to find the rational basis for action yes yep. but Okay, so let's say that you, AJ, you and I both agree. Let's 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 do it this way. You and I both agree that small scale, smutty things that delivered on text messages that should be dealt with between friends. We both agree with that. We can universalize that actually. Okay, right? me and Con. Yeah, yeah. Me, me and you. Me, me and you and Con. Me and you and Con agree. And you you and I both agreed that like much more serious, more um, immoral things uh, shared on text. That those things should be brought to. Uh, sort of higher authorities, especially if we're talking about school. So yeah, so yeah. especially someone that can handle yeah. it, maybe has more experience. Oh, yeah. Bigger yeah. things, so bigger things should be brought to it. Okay, cool. Then we get this example where someone has shared something and you say, that's small scale smut. And I say, that's, that's vile and big. And we are now both going to universalize our, our, you know, when someone, we are, the action we're going to do is I say, bring it to the authorities and you say, talk to your friend. We're both Kantian. Yeah, sure. But we're now doing different actions. Or if that girl came to us and asked us our advice, you would give her, talk to your friend about it, and I would say, bring it to the authorities. And her talking to two Kantian teachers has not actually helped her make a moral decision. Yeah, and I think what Kant would say, and I, I agree with you there, but I think what Kant would say is that one of us, either me or you, is having some sort of error in reasoning. It is either... A big deal, mm -hmm. or it is a little deal. Okay, is there a way that the categorical imperative can help us know whether it is a big deal or a little deal? Hmm, I'd have to think about that. Yeah, you just have to uh, universalize the smutty text. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like you, uh, all images that are this, this, or this are big deals, and this, this, and this are not. But then, how does that not get but us? I'm to not sure that that's hundreds a, and hundreds of thousands of maxims. But that's but. Could be fine. Uh, Maxim, um, already a pretty smutty publication. Okay. Hold on. <laughs> hey. Uh, um, I do think, I'm not keeping track of time, but I think we're at or past an hour, just in case you want to. Oh, geez, Louise. I know. Sorry. I, no, it's fine. I, I kind of, didn't I tell you I wouldn't get through did. it all today? All we right. can do, uh, talk more in the in-between. There's probably a lot more to discuss. Yeah, but I've, I've got at least another whole episode here worth of material. Let's do two more episodes on comp. Okay. Because you, um, you still have part three also. Yeah. Just to say, I, I think that you could, like, there's probably some Maxim there that we can universalize. And maybe it's just like, maybe you have to bring in, uh, I don't know. See, again, I'm, I'm kind of new to the whole Kant thing. Yeah. Um, I think there would have to be some sort of principle of action that could identify when, when the, the image is of an egregious nature and when it's not. And I think, I think people of like practical wisdom could e easily identify one of those. But I see your point. That, that, that might not necessarily help okay. if they come to two, two different Kantian teachers. And, I, and on, honestly, when we got there later, I was going to say this is probably one of the breakdowns mm -hmm. is when people have, like, two ra very rational people have a disagreement about the, the maxim, of the maxim, the maxim yeah. or the context mm -hmm. or which maxim applies, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. But I'm not sure his goal, again, is to make an easy, an easy hack to, to morality. It's to identify, like, to establish that there is duty 
and it is must be followed separate from any example or context. Mm -hmm. I think that's his goal, okay. right? It is a, again, the title, a groundwork for the metaphysics of morals. So if we're going to have a metaphysic of moral, we have to start somewhere. And I think he is trying to find that like, that core around which the world can be built. Does yeah. that make sense? The thing I can't tell with Kant is whether I think he's trying to be too big or he's being very, very small. Like the, the, the too big is saying like, here is the statement upon which we can now write out all morality by hand by thinking through the maxims. And then I would, or he's being too small and, uh, and he's just saying like, listen, whoa, 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 this isn't gonna actually help you solve and make decisions. It's just whenever you get to the right maxim, the, the right maxim is whether you can universalize it. That's all I'm doing. It's not actually going to... I think, I think it's the latter. I think and it I, is the latter, too. And I think what he's trying to do... I, again, I think he's in conversation with other philosophers. Yeah. And he's saying the way you guys are trying to do it, this popular philosophy where you are like deriving it from all these examples and try, like it doesn't work because it's context-dependent and because as soon as we try to say it is a universal law, it breaks down because I'm not that guy. Mm -hmm. He's like, here is one that we can abstract to universal law. Here's the logical basis behind it. Here's the rational basis behind it. And he's going to go further and even say, here is the ends that this categorical imperative always aims at, the end that cannot be anything except other than an end. Um, what is it? It's a, a rational being. Yeah. A rational being is an end of itself. And that's actually, I think, another place where it might fail. Mm. Um, but we can get to that next time. Holy smokes. Uh, that was a lot. That was great. We ended up arguing a bunch. I hope that's okay. <laughs> it's not arguing. What, what, what percentage of the, uh, of the chapter did we make it through? Like, um, uh, we what, probably uh, got through... Of what you brought. What percent did we make it through? I feel like we got through over half. Over half. 60%. I, I accept yeah. this. Okay, good. This uh, I, good. There are two more... So just as a preview for next time, there are two more formulations of the categorical imperative that he says, here's another way to look at it and here's another way to look at it. This is the form version I've given you that the... Categorical imperative establishes itself, right? That it says, I cannot be tied to any circumstances, means that all it can do is say your maxim must be universalized, and therefore it is established. Yeah. Then he's going to give two other formulations that help to establish it, and then talk about humanity and rational beings as an end unto themselves, and how kind of how it all works out a little bit. I like it. Um, I don't know that it's going to answer Grant's concerns. Maybe chapter three does that. We'll, we'll see. see. But cool. Well, this has been classical stuff you should know with Graham Thomas and AJ. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, you should be listening, and everybody should be listening, because it is a categorical imperative that it is mm -hmm. better for a man to listen to interesting podcasts at all times. Am I doing this right? Doing yep. a great job. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> you can find us on Twitter at CLSSCAL Stuff. You can find us, you can email us at theguys at classicalstuff.net. That is also our website. You can patronize us on Patreon, where we have in between episodes, where we have monthly AMAs. Um, and where we can answer questions in long, elaborate text th uh, uh, chat threads um, when you uh, say something interesting. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is the guy signing off. Bye. Ciao. Ciao.